This video looks at how you would incorporate constraints with an independent model approach to predictive control. So far then, the constraint code and developments, we've looked at a simple GPC algorithm, what happens if you add a T filter, and what happens if you do DEMC. Now, it was noted in the previous few videos that simple changes in the prediction equations, as you get with the T-filter and DMC, have led to relatively simple changes in how constraint handling is achieved. So what we're going to do now is use the same approach to look at what happens when you have an independent model form for predictions. And again, you will see that it's relatively straightforward. So just a reminder then of what happened to a GPC, you had a quadratic performance index, there's your quadratic part, and there's your linear part. You had prediction equations of this form with an H, a P and a Q, and you had constraints of this particular form here, where you had specific definitions for the matrices in this constraint equation. So what we want to look at is how does this change if we use an independent model form? Well, just a reminder then, an independent model structure is something like this. You have the real process, which does what it does and maybe has disturbances, etc., etc., and you will get a real output, which we assume we can measure. Now, in parallel with the real process, we simulate a system model, and that gives us a model output. And what we do is you calculate this offset signal as the difference between the real output and the output from our model. Now, this was discussed in more detail in Chapter 1, but the bottom line is we are going to take this signal here, this difference between the real process output and our model output, and that gives us an estimate for a disturbance which allows us to have unbiased predictions. Therefore, what we do is we put this term here, our offset term, into our prediction equations, and we end up with prediction equations a bit like this. Now, that was covered in Chapter 1. The key thing you'll notice is there's a part of it which is identical to GPC. That's this bit here. I've just circled in blue, but we've added onto that this offset term. However, there is one subtle difference. The Y here is the model output, not the true output. So you need to remember that in these prediction equations, the y is the model output. Obviously, the u's are the same for the model and the real process, so we don't need to talk about that. So how then do we do a constrained independent model GPC? Well, first of all, there's our prediction equations. So we simply substitute those prediction equations into our cost as before. So you remember the part that isn't going through the h delta u, that's this bit I've just circled in blue is the bit that goes here in the performance index. So it's a very simple change. We just substitute that part of the prediction into our cost function. What about the constraints? Well, again, you'll have noticed that the way the constraints worked is the prediction equations essentially went straight into the constraints. You see I had a P delta U, a QY passed, and an LD. So all we're going to be doing is adding this extra term over here that comes from this offset into our constraint equations, and you'll see it means we get this extra term here at the end in terms of our inequalities. Obviously, a reminder again that this past output is based on the model, not on the actual measurement data. So the GPC control law with an independent model predictions is defined like this. So there are your equations, and the key thing is, you know, how do I define this parameter A? And there it is, and you'll notice it has the offset term, and it has the model past data there. And how do I define these particular constraint matrices, DU, DDU, DY, DD, and so on? And that's all given down here. And if you need to pause the video and look at that more slowly, then you can do so now. What about MATLAB code, then? So there's several files. I'm not going to go through them all, but just so you know what they are. There's this file, IMGPC Constraints TF Model, and you'll notice, hopefully, the title is obvious. It's got the IM to tell you it's independent model. We've got IMGPC TF Law, and the key one, which we're just going to look at briefly, is this one here which is IMGPC TF Simulate Constraints. Now, it is a long title, but it's to make sure everything is clear. The IM 
tells you its independent model. The TF tells you independent model based on a transfer function and the constraints tell you it includes constraints. If you want to find the code, it's in the folder independent model MPC. And what you might want to do, of course, is compare how this works to standard GPC and GPC without a T with and without a T filter. Now what I'm going to do first is just have a quick look at this code so you can see how straightforward it is. And the main thing we'll do is we'll go straight to the quadratic programming part of the file where you update your controller so you can see how this works and you'll be happy it's exactly the same as what we've done before. So you'll notice here's a line which tells you how the constraints are defined and you'll see that matches what we have in the video should do unless I've missed a term off and then I've missed a turn off by the looks of it and then you'll see here in terms of our cost function we've got this x vector which multiplies du past y past r future and your offset so the key thing is you need to calculate this offset each sample and if you calculate update your constraints you'll see the dt here has got the dd term which is constant du times u past ddu times du past, dy times now ym past, and it's got that y to emphasize its model, not the actual process. And you see this other term, ddd times the offset. So hopefully you're clear. The structure is the same as ever, and you just plug these numbers straight into quad proc. OK. So first example, video 5.7, example 1. I'm not going to run this one. You'll see it's an identical example to what you had in video 5.4, example 1. And you get the same responses because here you'll see it's emphasized there is no uncertainty. And therefore, the predictions will be the same. The cost will be the same. The constraints will be the same. What about example 2? Example 2 is actually the same as video 5.5, example 4. And here we have this disturbance, so there is some uncertainty. Um, so you might notice that the responses are similar, but not identical. But the key thing is the code will deal with it. You notice the constraints in the input are satisfied. However, because this disturbance is so significant, you can't satisfy output constraints the whole time. And while you can't satisfy them, the code will ignore them. What about these next two? Video 5.7, example 3, and video 5.7, example 4. Now, the first one compares noise rejection with GPC with a T-filter. Now, you'll remember, if you put a T-filter into GPC, it tended to improve the noise rejection. And one of the reasons people use an independent model is that it has very good noise rejection properties. And we will show that. We'll just look at that example. And the second example, example four, is a MIMO example, as we've done before, just for completeness. So if we go and look at these, here's video 5.7, example three. And you'll see it simulates with a T filter and with the independent model. And of course, as ever, if you want to change some of these constraints, they're listed down here, change some of these horizons, change your A, change your B, change your T filter, you can do that. This is just an arbitrary example. So here's your two plots. You'll see on the left, we've got what you get with independent model. And on the right, what you get when you use a T-filter. And here, you will notice they're fairly similar in terms of the variance of the input rates and the inputs here. So in other words, what you're finding is that the independent model noise rejection is pretty similar to what you're getting from a T-filter. And that's sort of what you would expect. If we go to example four, this is the multivariable example. And I run that so you've got an awful lot of plots coming on here. And again, what you'll notice is things are slightly different. Um, so figure one is IMGPC. And then if we find figure four, that's the corresponding loop with the T filter. And you can see they have different disturbance rejection properties. And so if you look up here, where you get the disturbance rejection with IMGPC, you've got a different response from the T-filter. And that's because you have different mappings from disturbances to predictions with a T-filter and with an independent model. If we look at loop three, there's loop three for IMGPC. And there's loop three if you have the T-filter. And again, what do you notice? Oh, sorry, I've got those back to front. Here's IMGPC on the right. 
here's the T filter on the left and you see the responses are different the mapping from the disturbance to the predictions is different you get different responses I'm not going to say which is better because there is a lot of other issues going on there so the key thing here is these examples are somewhat arbitrary but you can edit the code to develop your own examples and comparisons as you desire and our intention here is just to make sure you've got some code which does the job and then you can investigate what you learn from that now, our final example example 5 is a MIMO example to demonstrate again that the code works and I'm not going to run that one but again you will notice the behavior is noticeably different from that with the T filter and the reason is that the disturbance model is different. You'll find the noise model is fairly similar. It is different, but it's similar. But the disturbance model in particular is different. But the key thing, so you can have confidence in the code, is the input constraints are satisfied throughout. So now you've got code for many different algorithms, and you should be able to run some comparisons and see how they all compare to suit your own needs. Now, just for completeness, in chapter two, we also looked at independent models based upon state space. <clears throat> in, if we had a state space model, we tended to prefer a performance index a bit like this. So we use the deviation of u from the steady state. You don't have to, but we tended to. And you had predictions a bit like this. Now, rather than going through all the development in this video of, OK, how do I do the constraints? How do I do this? How do I do the other? With this form of model, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave that to you. But there is some code provided, so if you want to run the code and see how this works, there's the code. It's imgpc underscore simulate, and you'll notice this code doesn't have tf in it. <coughs> the tf tells you it's transfer function based. This one is state space based. And here are the sorts of figures that you get out of this code. So you can run it if you want to and run your own examples. This particular code doesn't have output constraints in it but of course you could edit it fairly quickly if you wanted to to include output constraints so in summary this video has shown how constraints can be incorporated into an intermediate model form of GPC using transfer function models some MATLAB code is provided so you should easily be able to edit the existing code should you want to do some particular tests of your own some particular examples the only substantive change from GPC is the change in the prediction equations, and you'll notice that was relatively subtle. But the key point is the addition of the disturbance estimate, which impacts on, it gives you an extra term in the performance index and an extra term in the constraint inequalities.